I didn't follow our own rules. I didn't keep distance between the vehicles. I didn't follow the tire tracks. And um, I had two anti-personnel mines. In your story, Brandon, you served as a medic yes, that's in correct. Ukraine. You trained in Ukraine, yes. as it were, in the field, which sounds like a particularly gruelling, tough kind of on-the-job training. I joined Hospitaller's Medical Battalion. It's a volunteer, on-paid battalion with the Ukrainian army. Uh, at the time, they were still taking foreigners during the Battle of Kiev. And um, I was in the army, but I don't come from a medical background. I, um, I, I was offered a chance to join with, with the guys who I came with, who, who were combat medics from Afghanistan and such. And I thought I'd be a driver. Um, when I showed up in Kiev, there was no driver positions available, but uh, some gunner positions had just become available. Um, I, I wanted to help. I received all my training in the basement of a church. Uh, it's no secret now, St. Michael's, which is very prominent. Uh, it was a 10-day course for about 12 hours a day Yes. during the Battle of Kiev. So you, 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 you joined up to go out there to see what you could, could do. You went out, you joined up with a number of medics from different parts of the, of the service, different parts of, of the world. Did you go out thinking you were going to fight or to, uh, to do medical, medical work or both? I, I wanted to go with an open mind. Um, I, I figured the biggest asset would be if I told the truth and if I, if I didn't lie, even if I was scared. I'd, I'd never had a combat tour in the army. Um, I, didn't want, I didn't want anyone to get killed because of my lack of experience. So I, I was reluctant to, to join up the Legion. Uh, but the boys I came with were invited to hospitalers and, and they asked me if I would like to go. Um, and that was, I was scared to go to Kiev. Mm. For, scared for everything, but scared to leave Lviv and go to Kiev. Mm. But when, when they asked me and said I could join, well, do I want to help or not? Mm. I mean, look, obvious question, Brandon. Why did you want to go? I know you've done service in the army, mm. but what was in your mind when you thought, I want to go to, want to, go to Ukraine? Well, um, the shortest answer, but key, I'm a recovering alcoholic for 11 years, and uh, I don't want to go too far into the 12 steps, but I, from 26 on, I kind of had to learn how to relive life and, and do the right thing, and sometimes just do the right thing for the right reason. Um... I knew if I wouldn't, if I didn't go, I I would feel a, a pain inside. I I felt compelled to go and with just with an open mind, whatever would happen. That's an interesting way of describing it. And so so you went and you got your medical medical training. You said in the basement of a of a church, Saint Michael's, very prominent church. Joe Biden's been there since, but, yeah. but I was there first. So you were there first, <laughs> and then you went to do what you went there. It turns out to to do. Were you were you were you treating people on the battlefield or in the towns or what were you doing? Um, after the Battle of Kiev, I, I missed the Battle of Kiev. I can't claim any credit for that. Um, we were sent on an ambulance rotation. Our, our battalion gets sent to plug holes in various brigades. And our first rotation was actually in a hospital, the, the nearest hospital to the Russian lines between Poltavka and Hulipuli in, in Zaporizhzhia Oblast. I spent one month there um, and I learned the difference between good and bad pre-hospital care. Mm. I, um, Thereafter, I got my first front rotation uh, about maybe 15, 20 kilometers south. Um, so on the battlefield, in the very a, much in the front line? A couple kilometers back, yeah. Right. A couple kilometers back. And in this time, so even in that short time after you got there, you were, you'd, you'd been treating civilians and combatants and soldiers? We got some civilians in the hospital towards the end of my month there. Yeah. Um, wounded women in particular. Yeah. Uh, from artillery. In the city, who were hit by Russian Russian fire yeah. into the into the city, and 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 your patients, as it were, they were you say there were women there. Was this before many women and children and others left left Ukraine? This was in April. Uh, my whole time on the Zaporizhia front, uh, the first month in the hospital, uh, sometime in April into May, and then front duties uh, yeah. later on in May till June. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so women and and children, I'm guessing, who were victims. Of I've I've only I've only, oddly enough, all the civilians that were wounded were women yeah. uh, in that hospital. Mostly soldiers. Uh, they'd come in waves, um, but no less than five women. Because because the men were basically in the front line for the most part. Really. Front line. Uh, a, a lot of there's a lot, women tend to outlive men in Ukraine, especially in the villages. Don't yeah. don't ask me why. 
a lot of stubborn babushkas don't want to leave their home. Yeah, yeah. yeah. What, what was that experience like, Brandon, treating these women and, and some soldiers? Or did did you have in your 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 medical unit? Did you have the equipment and the supplies that you needed to give people decent care? In the hospital, it was sporadic as the supplies would come and go. Um, we made do. We made do. Um, Yes, we did, but more supplies came, and they came sporadically. Uh, M- MSF offered to help a lot, I, r- I remember them. Medicine, yeah. Frontier, yeah. And a lot of independent volunteers, mostly Ukrainians, like a man with a van. Yeah. There's a lot of that in Ukraine, especially Donbass, especially yeah. Donbass. These were Ukrainians helping out, or foreigners too, who were arriving from all over. Foreigners with, too. With supplies. Yes, men with, a, um, like a man with a van. A man with a van, yeah. I wonder what it, what it was like for you then as a as a foreigner arriving in Ukraine to, to join the work in the front line and in the, the those providing medical medical treatment. What sort of reception were you getting from Ukrainians, for example? At first, they were very sceptical of us. Uh, were there, they? Yeah, there were a lot of people, particularly in my battalion, that um, they liked to talk. Uh, one we called Captain America. I was in 5th Group Special Forces, 10th Mountain Division, been to Syria, Iraq. Those things were lost on the Ukrainians. They just want to know, what is your job? Are you a paramedic? Are you a driver? Are you a... Okay. There's limited language skills and most of them had never served before that. So the cultural references and the macho, it didn't mean anything to them. Yeah. It, not at all. Not at yeah, all. Yeah, yeah. So you, you met all sorts of people. There were people who were there just to help out. There were some people there when what you described as a kind of a macho, a bit of a macho, macho trip. But, the, but the, the work that was being done was so desperately needed. Yeah. The bravest person I ever met is a 19-year-old girl that really? I worked with. Yeah. Tell yeah. me about her. Her name's Nika. Uh, she's my best friend. I'm, I'm 37 and quite conservative and we're a different generation. Uh, she joined our battalion later in June, uh, but we, we originally started working together in, in Solodar. Um, I know a lot about Solodar. I was wounded there earlier in the year, but um, their team was outside Solodar and I, I helped them with a generator, with, with replacement tires. We went on to work for a couple months. Um, the first shell of the morning, I'm I'm a little bit jumpy and I'm more scared of the outgoing ones because they're quite close to you, like a mortar. Mm. Like if I'm driving down the road, Blahadatne outside Solodar, boom, uh, I'm a little bit jumpy. I've never seen her jump once. I've never seen her flinch one time. <laughs> yeah, It's a 19-year-old... A 19-year-old kid, girl, yeah. yeah. Um, and she's one of my best friends to this day. Well, well let's give her our very best wishes as well. And you... Look, you were, were wounded. You, you drove over a, over a mine. Is that what happened? Uh, I've also worked with the civilian evacuation effort, uh, Lemonsky region when we liberated it, but east of Bakhmut after Severodonetsk, um, and then Solodar. Uh, I, I was at the spearhead with some Ukrainian volunteers because uh, I had a, a good Pajaro that we could four wheel drive. Um, a, a week into working in Solodar, Civilian evacuation work tends to get more dangerous later. It's, it's counterintuitive. You do the easy work first, mm. if that makes sense. Mm. Um, we, we were working in Knopf uh, to, cross, to cross the river in Solodar or the stream in the Russian side. Um, I think we had taken about 50 people a day out at that time. And my last day, um, we got nine people out, four children. Uh, and the Ukrainians side had had mined the bridge with with the anti-tank mines that's that's very scary um russians have the ability through aviation and artillery to drop anti-personnel mines more or less where they please um we made it into Kanoff once and um we got nine people out um there was more people willing to go the the, the sooner the russians get there they're quite keen to go um i, I wanted to make one last run before dark. Mm. Uh, dark. Dark is very dangerous. Um, I, I didn't follow our own rules. I didn't keep distance between the vehicles. I didn't follow the tire tracks. And um, I had two anti-personnel mines. You yeah. drove over two? Yeah. And, um, and, and how were you hurt by that? What happened to you? Well, I've lost a lot of the hearing in my right ear. Um, I, I've sustained a traumatic brain injury. I, I, I do have cognitive, uh, some cognitive decline, I must be honest. Yeah. I, I spent a month in hospital. Yeah. I mean, Brandon, I mean, you hadn't seen active service before you were, even though you 
done service in the army. You haven't seen active service before you got to Ukraine. Well, now you've been in Ukraine for quite a period. Yes. And you've seen a lot of what war really is. Unlike, yes. Unlike, you know, the likes of me, the likes of us, we can't even really imagine it. And you've seen what it, what it is. You've seen people die. You've seen soldiers die. You've seen of men, course. women and children die. Can you put into words how that affected you? I, I don't know how it affects me. Um, sometimes I... I'm not a woman, but I've I've heard about menopause. Sometimes I have I have I on a quiet day I have some some hard minutes like a like a hot flash almost. Um, it, it's it's also very hard um, because I have to convey that message. Um, if you don't have social media in Ukraine, you, your unit doesn't get funding. So so I've had to do that through my my Instagram and my YouTube and. Um, you have to communicate with a lot of people when you have internet and your time off. And quite often I, I have to relive those experiences because we film our work and I have to present it or we wouldn't get the generators or the radios. Um, I've, I've had to do a lot of reliving of and it. That's related directly to, to social media, clicks directly. and hits. Yeah, well, everyone's heard of 93rd Brigade and uh, they're amazing. But why are they amazing? Because you hear it. You hear about, and they are fantastic, but so is 46th Brigade that was in Solidar. So people do donate directly to a particular unit because they see it on a YouTube clip. and Basically, basically. Instagram, YouTube, uh, I don't know about Twitter, I can't speak from experience. Yeah. But if the unit has a good social media or a press officer, or if they have a foreigner like me in the unit, um, they get extra socks, they get extra boots. <laughs> that puts a whole new... A new, a new colour on the way that it's operating out there and the way social media is doing what social media does. So you've been out now for a while, away yes. from the front line, away from, from Ukraine. Yes. You're going back. Uh, in about one month. In about a month. Just shy of a month. How do you feel about that? I mean, you said earlier on you, you could feel the, the nerves before you went in the first time. How does it feel now? Does it feel any more easier to handle? It's, um, I, I've had a hard time. I, 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 I didn't think I'd speak of this probably it sounds silly to you but um i thought it was a cliche i've lived in sweden for some time before the war and aurora 23 was i'm told the largest military exercise they've ever had uh going on when i came home i was home alone one day just looking forward to spending the day with my dog um bliss and uh, a fighter jet flew over my house i, I had somewhat of a panic attack um because we don't see a lot of aircraft in Donbass. Uh, I, I've seen sorties, I've seen them drop, but when, when I heard that fighter jet, um, it, it either meant something really bad was going to happen, and it, sometimes things like that. Even the trains here in London. I'm staying in Peckham uh, with a friend of mine, and, and it's quite rattly. Mm. Um, I, had to, I had to remind myself where I was. Yeah. Yeah. I have to go back. I have to go back. I don't have a. I do have a choice, but I morally I don't have a choice. Don't have it's a pretty choice. simple. It's well, pretty simple. Brandon, it did not sound silly. It did not sound. It didn't sound anything except. Uh, I want to say look, you go back with our very best wishes, and thank you so much for coming in here and telling your story. It's a real pleasure to be with you. Thanks for the opportunity, John. It was a pleasure. Good to talk to you, Brandon Mitchell. Thank you so much. Thank you, Brandon Mitchell. There, giving us his account of his time in Ukraine.